to Ignite 365 Outreach. Hallelujah. It says you've never failed me yet. They don't need to have yet in there. You wait. I'll give you, take the week off. Just wait around for God to fail you. You're going to need to take another week off. You're going to need to take forever off because God is not going to fail you. Not, God has not failed me yet. That's true. He has never failed me. And I can tell you to go through the Bible and find me somewhere where he failed anybody else. Find me in history where God has let somebody down and they can go, well, thanks a lot, God. You failed me again. Or you abandoned me, God. That doesn't happen, and that never will happen. So uh, we're going to be in Romans 9 tonight. I'm going to pray first uh, for the message and for, and for uh, just all of us here, Lord. All of us here, all of us out in video land. Um, we all got plates, you know. Some people got a little bit on their plate. Some people got a lot on their plate. Um, I particularly want to pray for a brother and sister Pearson over here, Lord. Uh, they're faithful servants of yours. I pray, pray for their plates, Lord, that we give that plate to you. And whatever's on that plate, Lord, we want to lift it up to your throne and pray that you're guiding them. And uh, just always whisper in their ears so they know you're with them, Lord. And there's people in here that got something they're struggling with that they keep between them, you, and the ground, God. I pray for those people and their struggles, Lord, that uh, they give it to you, Lord. They don't keep that. They, they surrender to you. They say, God, okay, I get it. I can't do this on my own. And we're not going to be able to do this on our own. But God says, come to me and I will give you my spirit. And then you can be like Christ or try to be like Christ at least. And that's the whole thing about it, Lord. We're going to be trying to look more and more like your son. Uh, help us to get through this uh, chapter of Romans 9 and we can live it out to your glory and through your power. In Jesus' name, amen. So my wife and I... Uh, we got some time away this week. We haven't done that in a long, long time. Um, so it's just me and her. We went to a castle, bed and breakfast, and uh, I, could, I couldn't keep her off me. It was She was just hanging <laughs> hanging all over me the whole week. All right, I made that part up. But on the way home, she did help me with the sermon, and she made a, she made a little slideshow, and we were reading about uh, Romans 9, and... Uh, about election, and you know, you could take, uh, you you could pull any room of believers and say, okay, uh, do you think that you can lose your salvation, or do you think that you once you're a Christian, you always have your salvation? And some of the people will say, no, you can lose your salvation, and some of the people say, no, you can't lose your salvation. Well, there's a lot of people who take chapter nine in Romans, and they see one thing in it, and some people see uh, the totally opposite thing in it. So what I found out in our study that my wife is definitely not a Calvinist. Because when we were talking, we looked at the Calvinist points of view, uh, she's like, no, 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 uh, no. So we're gonna go through this, and we're gonna look at uh, what this election Paul's talking about. And then the bike What's that? And then the bike surgery. Yeah, well, I, 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 I was, this is something I've looked at and studied, and it's like, man, they make good points here, man, they make good points here, but there's so many outside uh, of Romans 9, Bible sources, where it's like, wait a second. God says he doesn't want anyone to perish. It's like, wait a second, anyone to perish? He doesn't, that means that he's not electing some to salvation and electing others to be looked over and just have judgment or justice or damnation. So let's go on. Let's actually read Romans 9 um, and see what's going on here. Because Paul just left off in Romans 8 talking about, look, man, you have the life in the spirit. You've been predestined. You have been justified. You have been sanctified. And one day you're going to be glorified. And there's nothing that's going to change that. You're in Christ. He is the author of salvation. Or he's the author of your salvation. He will finish it. And uh, you're in Christ. So when you stand before God, you stand before him in Christ's instead. On Christ's merits. You either have that or you have your own merits. And our own merits or a dumpster fire. On Judgment Day, we go, God, I brought this dumpster fire. I brought these dead men's bones. That's all I have are my sins that you despise. Yes, and what else did I say about sins? They will be judged by death. So you can be condemned for all eternity, spiritual death and separation from God, or you can enter into his, uh, his love, his eternal relationship. And back to where he made us. We can actually operate in the way that he has made us. We got a glimpse of that when we have the spirit within us. We can now live that spirit life, which is a faith life. 
So you're either in the flesh, means you're operating by your five senses, and all you do is operate by your five senses, or you can be operating by faith. So in the flesh is unbelief. And it says that unbelief will never please God. Without faith, you can't please God. So you're either operating in the flesh in unbelief, which is the physical realm, or you're operating as a physical person, but in the spiritual realm, and you're operating by spiritual laws called faith. And God is pouring his grace into you and making you, it says you're a new creature. So that old stinking thinking that you hear a lot of in rehab, that old you that was a filthy mess in a dumpster fire, you've died to that. God has recreated you. And now he's going to say, you know what? I'm going to bring you along, pour my spirit into you. I'm going to watch this blossom fruit out of here, that the spirit's going to blossom this fruit, and you're going to be more like my son. And then you're going to be effective for my kingdom. Because guess what? You are a citizen of my kingdom right now. I have you as an ambassador on this planet. So you're coming with my authority. You're a resident of my kingdom. You're coming in my power. It's like, wait a second. Who would say, I don't want that? I don't want that. But people say it all the time. It says, broad is the road to destruction. And many take it. And you're not accidentally taking a path away from God. You are willfully choosing to go your own way. What's that song? Uh, who sings it? You can go your own way. Fleetwood Mac. Man, that, that was pretty good. Uh, even though that's Stevie wow. Nicks' part, I guess I'm singing too high. Wow. <clears throat> but, uh... God says you can go your own way. How many people did you see Jesus chasing after? Oh, you think I'm a blasphemer? Hey, stop, wait, no, wait, come back. Uh, 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 let's talk about it. No, he, you make your decision. Jesus didn't chase anybody down. If you want to go your own way, God's not going to be coming running behind you uh, and groveling over you. You choose your own way, and that's what you're going to be stuck with. So that's a lot in the way of... Uh, preview let's jump right in to chapter nine and, and what he's saying here is uh to the jews you're not special okay there's others that have been added in and that's us by the way we're gentiles what was that first what did the first slide say do you have a say in your salvation do you have a choice? Is the TULIP acronym? Can you put the TULIP acronym up? Do you have a choice in your salvation? So this is the acronym that they use for the five points of Calvinism. These are their doctrinal tenets. Calvinism is also known as Reformed Theology. And you'll see a lot of these. Uh, now, they've got good teachings and stuff. Like the, the people left, like Archie Sproul died a couple years ago. Very solid Bible teacher. Ligonier Ministry is very solid Bible teaching. Um, but on these points... It's like, wait a second, this doesn't, you know, the Arminian views, they call it. Uh, and they say, well, that's wrong. And they go, well, Calvin said this, or Calvin wasn't, uh, this wasn't what Calvin was saying. This was what Calvin was, uh, Augustine was saying, 300 years AD. No, no, this is what Paul's saying. So I'm saying, this isn't Calvin talking. This isn't Augustine talking. This is Paul talking. So we're going to read it, though, and uh, we're going to see why I believe what I believe. That you do have a say in your salvation, that you can accept Christ by surrendering. It's not like Jesus saying, hey, I got something for you. And you go, you know what? I will accept that. No, it's by your surrendering to Christ, acknowledging that you can only be saved through what he did on the cross. So that makes him your savior. And then surrendering your life to him. And that makes him your Lord. I am doing your bidding. I am under your authority. You are my Lord, and you paved the way for my salvation. You are my Savior. Okay? That's the choice. Tool up here, the acronym means total depravity. They say man is totally depraved, which I do agree with. Every man ever born from a woman is totally depraved. You are in a state of hostility towards God at birth. Does that mean babies and miscarriages and aborted babies and eight-year-olds and ten-year-olds go to hell? No. You know, God's, God is fair and just. Now, if you're 18, 19, and 20, and you're acting a fool and running from God, he might hold you accountable for that. But, you know, even though you're born evil and sinful with your natural nature, natural nature, that's a good, I'm going to coin that. With your natural nature, naturally, we're evil, okay? But uh, 
God has grace for that, for, for people who are young and don't understand. Total depravity. So the world is totally depraved. Then the next is unconditional election. This is one I disagree with, and we're going to talk about it because he talks about unconditional election in here. Meaning you don't have a say in your election. God chooses some to give grace to, to make them born again, and God overlooks others. He doesn't, it's not unfair because everybody deserves justice. We all deserve condemnation, but God chooses to give some grace. And then the Calvinist approach is also, you are born again first, and then you are alive spiritually and are able to put your faith in Christ. So you're born again first, called regeneration comes before faith. And I believe, no, you put faith in Christ, and then you are born again. That's what I believe. So unconditional election, limited atonement, we're not going to discuss that. Irresistible grace, that's another thing. That means God calls who he wants to call, for what reasons he wants to call, and you cannot change it. And they'll say, Paul on the road to Damascus was knocked off his horse by God. He saw Christ in the shining in the brightness as a noonday sun, and he said, Lord, you know, that was the first thing out of his mouth. They're saying by the time God or Paul hit the ground, he was already a born again believer. And there's nothing Paul could have done to re say, no, I'm going to keep persecuting the church. No, I don't want you in this sect. I want to still be sacrificing in the temple and be uh, paying my tribute to you, Yahweh. They're saying he could not uh, uh, resist that. So everybody that God says, I'm going to choose you to salvation, they cannot resist it. It's like a a tractor beam you see in the movies that as soon as you get in distance, it pulls you in to their fortress or their battle station and you can't get out of it. So that's the irresistible grace, which I also uh, don't believe in. And then perseverance of the saints is the last thing. That's the acronym for TULA. Perseverance of the saints is also known as once saved, always saved. That once you're saved, God is going to bring you all the way. We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about total depravity. We're not going to talk about um, limited atonement. We're going to talk about uh, unconditional election tonight, because that's what he deals with. Let's just read chapter 9, okay? Here we go. Verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. This is Paul talking, okay? He's making his argument. He's like, listen up, y'all. This, this is not my uh, uh, ramblings. He wants people to know, first off, that he gets all this from God. This is my revelation. This is from me, uh, through God, from God through me to you. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So he's saying, look, if I could get you guys, if you would come to the knowledge of Christ and salvation, I, I, I would trade in my salvation for you. I want you guys to come into the saving grace. And, and that's what I want to say right up front. There's nothing special about you that gives you a foot up with God. From your heritage to your bank account to how many, uh, my church growing up used to give little pendants for how many times, if, if you miss Sunday school or what, you get all these little pendants and stuff. People would have like mountains of them like they've been serving in overseas wars and stuff. Look at this. That's not going to get you any uh, foot up with God. And Paul's telling, look, you guys are Jews. You were God's chosen people. You were an instrument chosen by God to bring forth the Messiah and show what uh, people dedicated to God look like. And then we, they messed up really bad. But Paul's saying, you don't have a foot up just because you're a Jew. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brother and my kinsmen according to the flesh. So he says, we're brothers according to the flesh who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenant and the giving of the law in the service of God and the promises. He said, as the chosen people, you guys were chosen vessels, and God did all these things and made all these things through you, covenants, promises, law. Whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came? That's what he says about Jesus. He says, Christ came through you guys according to the flesh. Here's what he says about Jesus. Who is over all? God bless forever. Amen. It's like uh, he just stopped and gave an exaltation to Christ. Christ, who you came through the flesh. 
who is over all, God bless forever, amen. Then it goes, not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all the children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. So this is like their main tenet. They say, look, God chose Jacob over Esau. And then it says, it has nothing to do with works. It has nothing to do with anything you do, but of him that calleth. So Paul's saying, look, they were chosen, God chose ahead of time. And then the argument will be, so God didn't look down through the corridor of time and see who would accept him and those he elected. He's saying it has nothing to do with anything that we are doing. God chose Jacob over Esau before they had done anything, before they were even born. So let's go on. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now that's a way, that, that's symbolism there. Um, why would God hate Esau? He hadn't even done anything yet. And Jesus says, unless you hate your mother or your brother or your sister instead of me. And he, he's just using that idiom to show the strength of the opposite side. You better love me so much that in comparison, it appears that others are hated. That's why God takes the preeminence in our life. That's why it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. It doesn't say, when you got time, seek God. It doesn't say, if you can pencil him in on a given day to seek him. It doesn't say, when you need him the most, seek him. It says, seek him first. God has the preeminence in your life. He takes priority in so much that everything else is a distant second and third and fourth and so on. What shall we say then? So he says, that is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I saved. Hate it. So Paul's seeing a, uh, a question coming. He's saying there's going to be pushback to this. So he says this question, this rhetorical question, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? That's the question. Do you think God ain't fair? He's saying, God forbid. Let it never be so. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. That's God's sovereignty. I'm not saying that God is not sovereign in all his ways and can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, to whoever he wants, for whatever reason he wants. God is God, and everybody else is not. So you always got to hold God's sovereignty. But God's not going to be injurious to your free will. God's not going to take away your ability to choose and say, no, I'm making you do this. Okay, and it will never be something evil, let alone good, that he's going to force you to do. We always have free will and God's sovereignty always stand. So then, it is not of him, this is verse 16, that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even from the same purpose have I rise, raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, hath mercy on whom I will have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. That will say then unto me, why does he yet find fault? If God's doing what he wants to do, why am I guilty of anything? Okay, like I said, Paul had a choice. This is the awesome thing about God. You see me as Lord. You're going to follow me, okay? Because people think, all right, I'm a Christian now. It's all going to be uh, tiptoeing to the tulips. He says, you're going to follow me, Paul. And I'm going to show you how awesome it's going to be. No, he says, I'm going to show you all the things you're going to suffer. 
for my name's sake. Did Paul shrink from that? Or did he loosen up, crack his neck, and say, let's do it. Let's do it. Because it ain't him doing it. He knows it's God in him doing it. Pharaoh was rejecting God. Pharaoh's heart was against God. You know, it says in Romans earlier that God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to a debased mind, to an evil mind that only thinks evil all the time. They were already there. And God says, this is what you want? Here you go. Kind of like the Israelites going through the desert and wanting meat and quail. And they were begging and they were complaining. And God gave them so much quail that they were throwing it up, coming out of their noses. Okay? That's the same thing with Pharaoh's heart was already hardened. And God says, if that's how you want to be, all right. You're going to have it to the full course. You're going to be reprobate to the 10th degree. So Paul, or uh, this isn't looking at God being injurious to free will when he hardens Pharaoh's heart. And, and just like Paul had a choice to be the apostle to the non-Jews, he could have said, no, I'm not doing that. So did Judas had a choice. His heart was the same way. He was already bent on destruction. And God just used him as that willing vessel to do evil. And God gave him what he wanted. And he did what his heart led him to do. He says, has not the potter have power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So God can make a bedpan out of you. Or he can make a dinner plate out of you, is what this means, honor, dishonor. He can make a bedpan, or he can make a dinner plate, or fine china. God can do what he wants. Never dispute that. God is sovereign. What if God, here, here's what he says, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he make, might make known the riches of his glory, on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. For even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles, as he saith in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which has not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Do you know us, Americans over here, uh, non-Jews, we're, we're uh, those Gentiles, that's us. Those ones that said, those who were not my people have become my people. It says not everybody who's of Abraham is of the promise. Not it's the, or Those who aren't of Abraham, not everyone who's a Jew is of the promise. Not everyone who says they're of Abraham are. Abraham was counted righteous by his faith. And those who are children of Abraham are children putting faith in God, like Abraham died, like Abraham did. Isaiah also crieth, this is verse 27, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? So he's showing, look, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean anything. Just because your grandma, which mine did, played the piano in church and taught Sunday school, which mine did, doesn't make me any more follow of Christ than Muhammad, just because she is a Christian. And he's saying, your heritage as a Jew doesn't bring you salvation. It's faith. And faith in something, in someone, only one thing, one person, that is faith in Christ and faith in Christ alone. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, had not attained to the law of righteousness. So those guys were still going, no, we're, we follow Moses. We do the law. I tithe this, I do this. And Jesus says, man, first off, you all is lying. 
You devour widows' houses. You're supposed to be taking care of orphans and widows. You cash in on their money and leave them destitute. Don't tell me about being all high and mighty. You guys are the worst of them all. So don't be hypocrites. God hates hypocrites. And I've been a hypocrite a lot in my life. And, and when you're a hypocrite, you've got to repent of that. God hates that attitude. Don't think you're better than anybody else. Don't ever look down on somebody unless you're picking them up. Think about if God had to put grace in your life, where would you be at? You'd be on that broad road to destruction. God has grace that gives people a favor that we don't deserve. He shows it upon us. And to finish up, 32, wherefore, because they sought it not by faith. So those who thought they were righteous Jews, like the Pharisees, they weren't following God by faith. They were just following a set of rules and laws, and then they made up their own laws. And they had this righteous uh, sense, a false sense of belief that, look how good I am in God's eyes. And they were as vile as could be. That's not how God weighs the soul of a man. The soul of a man is corrupt unless Christ's righteousness has been credited to that person through faith. We all, we are saved by works, only the works of Christ. No other work, no other thing can be applied to us that will save us, except what Christ did on the cross. The only works we're saved by are Jesus Christ's works. And to finish, as is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone in rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Whosoever shall believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That rock was Jesus. They stumbled over the Messiah. They stumbled over him. Okay, God's going to show up. He's going to do signs and wonders. He's going to raise the dead. He's gonna, the blind are going to see. Uh, here he is in the flesh. Literally, God in the flesh is doing all these things. And you're going to say, no, you are a blasphemer doing these things by the power of Satan. Now, why did they do this? Because they wanted the power. They liked their prestige. Jesus says, you guys like the long prayers. Everybody thinks you're all that. You like the fancy seats in the banquet halls, so people can think you're all that. You know what? If a pastor is preaching about himself a lot or that he's all that, he's a false pastor. you got to be glorifying God. Everything should go and point to Jesus. If you're going to be talking about yourself, say, without Christ, I am a wretch in ruin. If not for Christ... I would be hellbound. It's all Christ. It's all to him. So, what do we got up there on screen? Romans 9, what's it say? The righteous shall live by faith. So Paul is not saying that, look, there are few people, because it's few, because the road to salvation is a small road, a narrow road, with a small door, and few people be on it. But the road to destruction, the road to people that don't accept Christ, is broad. And they, they, the, the, the Calvinists will say, you have no choice in the matter. Does that sound like something that God would do? Not give you a choice and give people hell? Now, let me tell you this. Why does he say... Let's read 2 Peter 3. The Lord, this is verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If God doesn't want any, that you know, what does the word any mean? He doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want any to go to hell. Any. Now, that wouldn't make sense if he's electing some. Well, why, why would you elect some to damnation or elect some to not receive your grace? Why would you only elect a small few to salvation if you don't? That makes no sense. That makes God speaking confusion. And then it says, not only that, that he doesn't want any to perish, but that he all should come to repentance. He doesn't want any to perish. and wants all to come to repentance. John the Baptist was proclaiming the one who was coming. He was pointing repentance. John preached the baptism of repentance. That's what all who come to God need to do. They need to change their will. I'm laying down my old hostile life. The wife that was hostile to you, I'm laying that down. 
I'm coming to you. I, could, I know my life is nothing. It was nothing but a dumpster fire. And nothing I can add. Everything I do in my life without you is going to go in that dumpster and catch fire. That's repentance. Making it about face. I was going away from God. Now I'm coming towards God. The old things that I found pleasure in, I despise now. Evil that I like doing, it says a shoe in the King James. That doesn't mean it smells. It means, well, it does smell. It smells foul. But a shoe means to, to have nothing to do with evil, to despise evil. That's what repentance does. Now you want the things of God. And now instead of saying, God, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do this, this, and this. And when I need you, I'll let you know. I'll holla at you when I need you. No. When you turn and repent towards God, God, here I am. What are we doing? I can't do it without you. That's why I say we. You know, there, when people say let go and let God, that's not very biblical. Let go and sit back, uh, floating on your pool noodles, and let God do some stuff in your life? No. God is working through you. So you're clinging to God, and he's clinging to you. If we had to hold on to God, we would lose our grip, but God holds on to us. So there's no departure. There's no letting go. But you need to let God do his thing in your life. And you cooperate by following his leading, by living out his truth. He's got it all in here. What, is there another slide? There's two of them. Okay. So, for God so loved the world. Everybody knows this verse. For God so, wait a second, I said that. Did I say that right? Or is it for God so loved the elect that he sent him his one and only son? That if the elect who are actually going to believe on him, regardless, will have everlasting life and not perish. It doesn't say that. He loved the world. He sent his son that whosoever believes. Paul is saying here in Romans, the, 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 the road to salvation is not a small road. It's not just the Jews are my chosen people. He's broadening that road. He's enlarging that road. Now look. Everybody can come. Everybody can be a child of Abraham who operates in faith. What did it say? Why was Abraham considered faithful? He was considered righteous because he trusted God. That's what we need to do. Do you know the word faith and believe? That word in is trust. It's in that word. You trust, not yourself. We know Proverbs says, don't lean on your own understanding. Man, you know how stupid I, my understanding is? It's dumb. It's stupid. My wife's raising her hand in the back. She said amen. She amen that I, I do make stupid choices. But when you live with the Holy Spirit in you and you work with the Spirit, he's going to give you wisdom. He's going to light your path. This needs to be your worldview. You need to be in a church with fellow believers. You need to be fellowshipping together. And then it's like that spreads out and you bring other people and you fellowship together. We are changed people. We have new lives. Now we don't want to be selfish and closed in. We want to be sharing the love of Christ. And there's so many ways. I haven't yet ran my card into somebody at the store and says, I don't know what I'm doing. I want to talk to you about Jesus. So I just thought I'd run my card into you. That's a good opener, okay? Then they're going to go... Security! <laughs> then you can witness to the police. <laughs> Anyways, so I, I don't think that's what it's saying that uh, this is a God elects some. He's saying, listen, what was the sign we saw? Repent and believe on Jesus and thou shalt be saved. Okay? It doesn't say, but it only pertains to the elect. You are an elect. God has elected to bring you to salvation, and he sent his son to pave the way, to make the way, to do the way. Rachel. So what? What? <laughs> that is your line. You're supposed to yell louder. I want my wife to yell. So what? So what? What do you mean, so what? I want my wife to yell that at, at the end of every sermon. So what? Why did you tell me all this, Pastor Brian? Why did you read Romans 9? Why are we going through Romans Chapter by chapter. Why? So what? Here's what it means. It 
doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter if you were a Jew. That gives you no leg up. It doesn't matter how many times you've been to prison. That doesn't keep you away from the cross. The cross is there for everybody. Do you know prisons are more than just razor wire and locked doors? There's people in prisons of addiction. There's people in prisons of lust. There's people in prisons of mental illness. There's people, not that that's a sin, I'm just saying, Jesus paid for all our infirmities, sicknesses. He bore to the cross, paid for it in his blood. It doesn't matter if your grandma was a saint and your grandma is the 25th outer bowing uh, at Jesus' feet because there's only 24 in Revelation. I don't care if she's sneaking up in the back and bowing. I mean, God's not going to say, get away. No, you're, I don't care if your grandma's the 25th outer up there. It doesn't matter when it comes to your salvation. I'm not going to walk before God on Judgment Day with my mom and dad saying, will you guys please? When I got locked up, my mom, and t uh, I remember my mom or dad says, he don't need prison, he needs help. And they says, well, when you commit these kind of felonies, <laughs> that's not an option. <laughs> but they were saying, look, you know, he needs some drug and alcohol treatment and, and uh, he needs to go to the common sense store. No, what I needed was to stop running from God and living for the devil. Man, I, when I went out on a ride, the devil was shotgun with me. He was shotgun. The vaccine was full of demons. And I was like, where are we rolling to tonight, boys? And that's how I live my life. You know what I would say, though? Tomorrow, God, I'm going to kick these guys out, and you're going to be shotgun. God doesn't want to be shotgun. God wants to be behind the wheel. He wants to be at the wheel of your life. So it doesn't matter how long you've been away from God. It doesn't matter how evil you have been in your life. It doesn't matter how good your parents speak of you. You know, there's that old football coach uh, from Florida. And it seems like Florida State, where all these people were getting in trouble. The quarterback was stealing crab legs one time and put him down his pants. They're doing stuff at the strip club. They're, they're getting into problems. Florida State was always having problems. And Bobby Bowden would always be interviewing, and they'd say, hey, what about Jameson Winston? Oh, he's a good kid. He, you know, he just messed up. He'd always say that. Oh, he's a good kid. No, we're not good kids, Bobby. We're evil and stupid, and we need Jesus. That's it. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about salvation. It doesn't matter if it's not Jesus. It doesn't matter if it's, well, all religions lead to heaven. No, that doesn't cut it. Well, I'm spiritual. That's great. So is the devil. Okay? It doesn't matter what we think. It's what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. So stay in your word. As the band comes up, I'm going to end in prayer. Stay in your word. Man, I'm really wrestling with this. Pray about it. Pray in the word. Read some psalms. Meditate over them. And here's my hardest thing. I will talk to God, and then when I say amen, now say I'm, I, I drive like 45 minutes to work. I'm talking to God in the car, and uh, I say amen and turn the radio on. Uh. It's like, okay, I just talked to God, and instead of listening, I reach for the radio. Okay, we got to stop reaching for the radio. We need to have that quiet time, like Elijah in that cave, waiting to hear from God. You know, we shouldn't move in our life. We shouldn't make decisions in our life unless we know God's in them, unless we know this is God's will. And sometimes I can't hear God's will. And I say, Lord, I'm going to do this. I think it's what you want me to do. And if this is not your will... Hit me over the head with a spiritual two-by-four. Show me some reason that I shouldn't do this so I know your will. But, man, God wants a relationship with us. And however you come to him, it doesn't have to be the way your dad did or the way your mom did it. You come to him just as you are and give your life to him. I could ramble on about that all day. Amen. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. That's That should be our... Our uh, mantra for life, for lack of a better word. Uh, good to see everybody. Have a blessed week. Go out there and love on somebody, all right? This world's evil. It's dark. It's messy. Uh, show the love of Christ. Amen? Yeah. All right.